Welcome everybody, I'm your host, R.R. Slugger, and as you can see here, we're doing something very different today. We're not going to be talking about Lego, sorry if you're here for Lego. I don't know what gave you that idea, <laughs> this being a Lego channel and all. Uh, I apologize for wasting your click, but here we are, we're going to be talking about music. And in particular, I'm going to be taking you through my process of writing and recording music uh, because I received a few requests from people asking about this, so I thought I'd oblige. Anyways, I just want to talk about a few things right off the hop. You're probably noticing the microphone quality isn't as good as it normally is. Well, the, the reason is we actually need to use Cubase here, the program that I would normally record audio through, but we need we need to be able to you know jump around and actually play some of the music here so that you're able to hear that at the same time. So I'm using a less less great microphone. Hopefully the quality is not that bad. It's the same one I use for live streams as well. But uh, yeah, I just want to get that out of the way. Um, I'm using Cubase. Here, this is Cubase Elements 9. Um, there are many programs that do exactly everything that Cubase does. And uh, Cubase was actually, <laughs> this is not a, um, an advertisement for Cubase because uh, I'll, I'll put the picture up on the screen. This is what I had to do in order to allow OBS to record Cubase at the same time. It, it's such a mess. Uh, yeah, I spent a few hours trying to troubleshoot that. Uh, because Cubase likes to just grab hold of your sound card and not let any other program use it, uh, which is annoying. Anyways, with all that being said, I wanted to start by going through and talking a little bit about my overall philosophy when it comes to writing this music, as well as some do's and don'ts and just some of, uh, some of my uh, feedback on, on that sort of idea. Uh, first off, these are not high works of art, <laughs> what I'm creating here. I'm, I'm tickled pink that people seem to be enjoying it. That's awesome. But no, this, this is not, uh, <laughs> this is not what I'd consider to be high works of art. There's lots of stuff that goes on in here, mind you. But, um, yeah. So, so, so don't take this as being me just saying like, hey, look at how great this music is that I've created. Uh, no, nothing, nothing of the sort. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, uh, let, let, let's start with the basics here. So the first project file I have open here is the song Driller Night, or what became Driller Night. Um, when it was originally recorded, the working title was A Fifth Apart, in reference to some of the synthesizer parts that are played throughout here, um, being an interval of a fifth apart from each other. So I want to go through and kind of isolate some of the parts and talk about, okay, how do I go about writing music? This is the first Rock Raider song that I wrote, uh, if I recall correctly. It was this one, as well as The Path to Power. Those were the two uh, first ones, and that was even before they had Rock Raiders titles. Um, yeah, so starting out with, uh, you obviously need to be picking a tempo, BPM. So I've got my 110 here for this song, and you're probably going to want to record a uh, rhythm track. Something. Oh, interesting. So that's the rhythmic fifth going on there. Where's the drum track? Oh, there it is. Okay, cool. Let's go find the drums. All right, so here we are. When you're going through and recording things through a DAW like this, you're going to want to make sure that you label things. And you want to label them before you hit the record button. I, I've learned this the hard way through many, many years. But uh, yeah, don't let this say like audio zero one forever, because once you start hitting record, it's actually going to name all of these things after whatever name you give it here. And I imagine other DAWs work very similarly. Now, the reason why you want these to be named properly is for if whatever reason it, your, um, your audio gets unlinked, you need to find it, and it's going to be in a folder somewhere, and you want it to basically have that name so that you can search for the actual audio clip that you're looking for. The, the, the stuff that you see here in front of you, these are just shells. It, it's like when you use a video editing software. It, it's, it's not the actual physical source of this audio. This audio is saved somewhere else on the computer, and you need to be able to go and find it uh, if, if something goes wrong. So you want it to be named exactly what you want. Uh, another, another little point, too, is that you want these names to be as descriptive as you can, because if you ever come back to a project, let's say years later or, or a year later, like I'm doing here, you want to be able to find what did you do to make this sound right? Because maybe you'll, you'll be writing a new song, you're recording a new song in the future, and you want to use, oh, I remember that tone I was able to get on that, that synth pad that he used in this one song. And if you go back and it says audio 01, that's not helpful. That's not going to help you recreate that sound at all. 
So in a lot of cases here, for a lot of my patch settings, I'll actually write, okay, what is the patch setting called? Bubble ambience, right? Stream ambience, <laughs> uh, rhythmic fifth. Solar plexus, and in this case here, this is great, because not only am I list, uh, listing the patch name here, but I'm actually listing what bank it's stored in on the synthesizer. So this is one that, like, solar plexus doesn't give me enough information, so I decided to put in brackets, it's a, it's in the synth, uh, synth FX bank. So that's where I'm going to find it later if I want to find it. And uh, just so you have a chance to hear what that sounds like, it should be this little thing. Here, we'll get rid of the drums there. It's very subtle. Let's increase the volume so you can hear it. And that's just kind of ambient in the background. So if I ever wanted to find that again, now I know where to find it. So first things first, as I take a look at the whole project as a whole, this one's actually pretty simple compared to some of the Rock Raiders projects that I ended up making later on. Not a lot of channels here, 16 tops. Yeah, so so not, not a whole lot of stuff. And as you can see, a lot of them are empty here. I just didn't end up using them. Uh, so you have your kit, obviously, and that, that's your, your drums. Um, conventional wisdom says start with the drums because that's basically your metronome. You wanna make sure that lines up, whoops, uh, with your metronome. Now, how do I go about recording the drums? I don't necessarily do it the same way uh, other people might. <laughs> this is kind of a uh, an, an old school solution to it, but I physically plug the synthesizer into the uh, the audio interface device, and then I just use one of the drum loops that's saved in the synthesizer, and I just hit play on the synthesizer, and I hit record on this end, and then I trim it up so that it all fits within a, uh, a little little uh, chunk like this. A few measures. And uh, as such, you can probably just take one of these, and if I grab it here and just move it, uh, whoops, move it down to here, I could probably extend it out. Uh, yeah, on that side and on that side. Yeah, so you can see there, there's a little bit of the uh, tail end on each side. And then what I ended up doing is just trimming it, and then you copy and paste as many times as you need. And uh, Cubase is a program that allows you to do that really easily just by pulling this aside, so you can make multiple copies. Uh, but I'm sure other DAWs will allow you to do that too. Now, one of the things I like to do is color code things, um, not with any particular strategy here, but one thing that I find important is that I do want my drum parts to be a little bit different. And I, I don't actually recall if this one does have different drum parts. So you got this one beat here, and then you've got this beat here. Oh yeah. So you can hear it's just changed up the percussion elements a little bit. That's good, that's good. And visually identifying that it has changed, I think is important, it makes your workflow a lot easier. So you can see towards the end of the song, that yellow part comes back. Looks like there's some other percussion parts that come in here too. I'm actually not familiar with this is. Oh, it's a kick pedal. It's gotta be a kick pedal. Let's listen to that. Yeah. I think what I decided is I just wanted to combine the two elements. So there's lots of kick going on here in the, in the end of the song. We got that face. Yeah. Now this is a synthesized bass. This is not a um, this is not a physical instrument. You can really hear that, I think. Okay. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to go through too many more of these uh, other little things that are going on in the song. I don't think I don't know if that's incredibly interesting, but I do want to talk about composition um, philosophy here, which is basically how I'm going about writing basically all of the Rock Raiders songs that I've been working on. You want to have an A section and a B section. So many uh, songs in this genre of music, which is a genre I don't necessarily enjoy listening to, this kind of 90s, early 2000s techno sort of stuff, it really wasn't my jam at the time, just because those songs are so often written in what I like to consider layers. Like there's a drum loop that just goes throughout the whole thing. You get your first element, and then you layer the next element, and then a couple measures later, you, measure, you layer the next element, and then a couple of measures later, you layer the next one, right? And so on and so forth like that. There's just no differentiation. It's like the chord progression never changes in those songs. 
And that to me is just a really boring uh, principle to listen to. Now, I probably lean on that a little bit with these these uh, songs myself, but uh, the reason why I'm writing music like this is because it's, uh, frankly, it's it's easier than than the other music that I normally uh, go with. So this is a great, uh, like, like if you're a beginner or if, if you're, um, you know, intermediate and you're starting out and you want to work with this sort of stuff, I think this is a great genre to tap into. Anyways, uh, I, I do try to separate my songs up into what I would consider to be an A section, which would be oftentimes like this material right here, and then a B section where things change, which would be this material here, including the guitar and the Moog down here. Ooh, I didn't realize I used the Moog on this one. Nice. Yeah, so that, that's that's from the uh, Moog Grandmother is the, the name of the keyboard. This is what it sounds like. So believe it or not, that is not a piano. Uh, that, that is a Moog analog synthesizer. Really haunting. And if you mix that with the 12-string guitar, this one is not a physical guitar. This is a synthesized uh, replication of a guitar. Very nice. Let me get the strings in there too. largely all that's happening in this section here. That's actually not a lot of layers. So there's three layers of that going on, and what else is happening here is we do have the limiter kit as well as the rhythmic fifth down here, and this ryth rhythmic fifth, uh, fifth sorry, is the bass line. Yeah, and then you add the other layers on top. That's what you get. The B section. <laughs> Yeah, and so your A section sounds a little bit like this. Now, I'm already breaking my own rules because I know I was talking about how chord progression changes are important. And you actually see them, they're physically represented here uh, visually through the colors. So the purple here, I think, is G minor. I think we're in the key of G minor for this song. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like G minor to me. And then I think the blue one goes to B flat minor. Yeah. Up to the four chord. So uh, the progression here is between one and four, Roman numeral one, Roman numeral four. There's no other chords uh, in the song. Now in the parts here, you hear the, the, the high parts, they're doing quite an elaborate pattern there. And there are some accidentals used in that, if I'm not mistaken. So this sort of stuff might be a little intricate if you don't have a working knowledge of music theory. Um, I, I can't really recall what the notes were that I played here, so I'll talk about this sort of stuff maybe later in the video here, uh, when I've got a song that's a little bit more recent. Yeah, but by and large, that's what we're looking at here. So A section, B section, A section, B section, right? Split it up like that and try your best to uh, make each section different um, between the two. Uh, noticeably different, recognizably different. If you want to think of it as verse, chorus, verse, chorus, that's kind of what I think of it as personally. And I think that works quite well. So let's take a look at another song here. So here we are taking a look at the next song, and I have to say, just off the hop, I thought I did something wrong because there are almost <laughs> no layers in this thing. What's going on here? Only five layers to the entire song. This, this song here is what later became the path to power. Uh, when I started out making it, uh, it was it had the working title, Let's Build. So <laughs> I just thought it kind of sounded uh, build-like, and it's the one that starts like this. Then we have it split, and we have our Moog bass line again. That's pretty cool. So this is a synthesized bass line, of course, and it's done on that Moog grandmother synthesizer there. Now we actually have a physical bass in this song as well, too. It's this one down here. Shut back up. Nice little harmonic there at the end. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when we're taking a look at this style of song, you can see that same idea that I talked about in the last one here. A section, B section, right? And you can see that, that I'm color coding it there in the drum part as well too. Now, this song in particular 
started me down this path that I've kind of kept going through pretty much all the rest of the Rock Raider songs. This idea that you don't want to overdo the fake sound because if because if I if I go ahead and I grab everything here that was made on a synthesizer, it's that. Right? <laughs> it's nearly everything here is quote unquote fake, right? Now you want at least at least I think uh, for 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 my perspective here, you want to include at least one real instrument if you can. And I think it's just because the human ear is pretty good at detecting fake sounds. And so if you can have just a little bit of reality in there, I think it really helps. So this is a bass guitar that I'm playing here uh, through the DI. And I've, of course, I've thrown a bunch of things on it. I've got a maximizer going just to get the big, fat energy going with it. I've got a compressor going alongside of it as well, too. And there's the compressing settings. And then chorus effect as well. I think this was a really good choice on my part. So let, let's hear it without any of the effects first on the bass. I'll go ahead and just bypass all of them here. So here it is, just clean, straight through, just the bass guitar. And let's go ahead, we'll throw on the maximizer first. Let's hear what the what it sounds like with just the tube compressor. Not a lot of change between any of these. The big change comes from the chorus. The chorus effect, basically what it does is it almost makes it sound like there's two basses slightly playing out of tune with each other. And I know out of tune might be a, a faux pas here, but that, that can be a big benefit, uh, especially when you pair it with the, uh, the other two plugins that I have there. It's a nice big bass sound. <laughs> I'm kind of shocked, honestly, that it's just a drum part and just a bass part. This is not something I would do uh, these days. Um, but I guess a year ago, Slugger decided that, yeah, it's just, you just need two parts there. Yeah, and the, the whole idea with this, this song is that it trades off between the Moog synthesizer and the bass guitar. And basically, it's like trading fours, um, where we're going back and forth, almost like, like a jazz song. Uh, we get those little solos there, and then we get again the Moog Dynasty strings here. Is what they're called, and it sounds like a piano, but it's not a piano. This is actually an uh, an analog synthesizer. <laughs> Didn't bother to crossfade that. Guess I could have. So here, here's one of the uh, one of the cool things about audio engineering and building in general is that. Little mistakes like that, I don't know if you heard it, I'll play, play it again here. You can hear that right here on this, this uh, where the, the two clips split, there's a, there's a uh, cutoff of the sound. Right? <laughs> it, just, it just stops. So that's something that, uh, it, like, when you view it on its own, it's like, whoa, what a terrible mistake. But if you throw it in the mix here, and you got enough things going, and you're not listening for it, you probably won't notice this just kind of flows into the next part there. And that's one of the beauties of audio engineering. There is no objective right or wrong, it's whatever sounds good. And if you can't hear a problem that might exist in the end there, then it's not a problem. That's that's just one of the things that goes with it here. So here's the next song we're gonna look at. This one is Rock Hard. And uh, when I wrote this song, this was the first song that had its proper Rock Raiders name, and it's actually what inspired me to go back and rename the other two. Now, this song I needed for the intro to the very first episode. It wasn't the first song I wrote, because uh, I needed background music for the rest of the episode, but I needed something for that stop-motion intro, and this is what I came up with. So I decided to base it on the intro to the PC game, and I replicated the trumpet sound and the strings at the same time, so I've just got two, uh, two channels here dedicated towards this intro sound. Now, on its own, I think it sounds very evocative of the start of the PC game, but when you have the drop with the <laughs> drums and bass, it changes the tone. <laughs> I 
<laughs> kind of a cheeky way to do that. Anyways, here we are. We've got that limiter kit again. And, and all these drum kit parts that you're seeing are all recorded the same way. It's just physically plugging in a synthesizer into my uh, audio interface device, recording it straight in, and then lining it up to the, to the grid afterwards, and then just copy and pasting as much as you need as you go. Uh, again, it looks like we've got our A section and our B section right, as we move throughout. This one is actually one where I felt there was a lot more um, physical instruments, like real instruments going on in this song. And as you can see, there's just not a lot of layers again. Uh, the, the, for for uh, my typical composition these days, what is this, six active layers or so? Yeah. And there's a lot of sections where there just isn't any like synth pads and things like that, stuff I would normally slap on. Um, so in this case here, we have a guitar part down here. Now this one I've, I've labeled Viper U07 because this gives me information uh, in terms of what guitar I used as well as what uh, amp simulating uh, um, simula simulator or what uh, setting I used for it as well too. Here it is. little bit of echo on the end there and that's using some automation so if I crack this open here you can actually see where that automation comes in now if you are unfamiliar with automation it's definitely something that you need to get familiar with basically what it boils down to is back when artists were recording on physical consoles uh, analog consoles let's let's take pink floyd for example uh when, when pink floyd was recording dark side of the moon with alan parsons uh they had to all stand around the console during that final pass of the song on the run and they all had to grab different dials and, and and faders and they would physically make the performance happen by turning certain sounds up and panning them left and right and this was all done physically manually right and nowadays you can actually do that just through automation you don't need to worry about uh, having to gr grab a dial or move a fader as the song is exporting. That's basically what they had to do back then. Now, nowadays we can pre-program that in and that's where the name automation comes from because it's automatically doing the work that you normally would have to do on your own. Um, there's some cool things you can do with automation. Let, let's just grab, a, let's grab this bass part here real quick. And just as an example, we can pan this across the across the uh, soundscape here. So I'm gonna add in a panner, left, right, perfect. So normally the bass is kinda hanging out here, kinda centered. Now what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna have it pan uh, left, right. So I'm just gonna grab it here, or right, left here, and then we'll go left. And so it should transition from the right ear to the left ear. Hopefully that worked okay, but that's the idea. It allows you to do things like that. You can you can control volume levels with it. You can turn on effects or control the rate of effects as well too. Plugins, I should say, actually, yeah. Now, in terms of this bass part, since I've got it here, this is actually one where I really wish I would have thrown on uh, the chorus effect from the other one. I've, I'm just not digging the, the bass tone here. It's not, it sounds a little crackly. So if I can go in and do a little bit of a George Lucas special edition here, I think I will. I'm just gonna go ahead and throw on a chorus effect here. Let's grab that flying bass again. That's a good chorus effect. And let's see if that changes it up enough. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like that a lot better. <laughs> so, whoops, I guess I should have thrown on the chorus effect. Uh, actually, we can hear it with the drums too, I guess, yeah. It gets a little busy, but it's it's not the end of the world there. Yeah. You know. Now this is another one where we have the Moog making another appearance here with a new patch that I developed in July at that uh, that time here, and I really like the sound of this one here. I think it got a great tone. <laughs> actually gets really wild for Jen. I'll get rid of the fade so you can hear it. Yeah, 
yeah. <laughs> I was really, really uh, in love with that, that sound. So I was really happy to include it here. So again, that's that analog synthesizer, which is different than the synthesizer that I use for all the rest of the stuff. I guess I should mention that one. Uh, I use a Juno G, a Roland Juno G synthesizer. And I've had that for uh, basically ever since it came out. Um, so it, again, it's not necessarily something you need to go track down because a lot of the patch sounds are pretty dated sounding. So you, you probably just want to get a new one, uh, something newer. <laughs> yeah, this is giving me some street heart vibes. Yeah, this is actually another song. It's in the key of G minor uh, because I think the the intro chords, this part here, is all in G minor. If I recall correctly, it's been a while since I've obviously recorded this or played it. So yeah, G minor, that probably takes us to the four chord again here. So that's probably B flat there. And you can see I've color coded it a little bit differently just to keep track of the keys as we go through. But uh, other than that, there's nothing else to say about this one. Very simple. Here we have our next song. This is Water Lot of Fun, which was a song I wrote specifically for the Rapid Rider video. I had this little musical motif in my head that I just wanted to get uh, re recorded and I, I heard it and I wanted it to be the start of that video. So anyways, what do we have going on in this one? Because it's kind of a strange song. It's a very short song as well too. It's only about a minute long. Uh, well, there's this part that happens right at the start, this little repeating pattern. It's made up of 10 notes in total. The first five notes are the major pentatonic scale in the key of A, and the next five notes are the minor pentatonic scale in the key of A. So it goes between major pentatonic, minor pentatonic. And as such, it puts this song in the time signature of 5-8, which is pretty difficult to work with, if I have to say. We get one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Right. And then normally the drums would kick in here. Now this song was tricky because I couldn't actually do my typical uh, drum part uh, stuff that I normally do where I record it off the synthesizer uh, because there was no drum parts on uh, preloaded in my synthesizer that were in 5.8, uh, obviously. Uh, so I had to play this with the finger drum. So I'm just pressing the keys with my fingers here to make the drum part. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. All right. Now, even this song, even though it has this weird drum pattern to it, it, it eventually goes to a different 5 8 pattern that emphasizes different beats. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. In 5-8 time signature, you can break it up two different ways. It's one of the one of the few time signatures where you can kind of split it uh, in, in two different ways because it's made up of a group of three and a group of two. And if you put the group of three first, you get one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, which is what we had at the start here. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And so you get the emphasis on beat four. But if you split it up the other way and you put the group of two first, you get one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, which is what we have here at the end. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. If I'm honest, I actually prefer the drum beat that I uh, ended up closing the song with. And I felt like this drum beat could have probably been the drum beat for the whole song, but this song was really suffering from uh, monotony, I think. This, uh, this, relentless pattern up at the top here. Uh, just, I don't know, it can get really grating, I think. Yeah, so then we get everything kind of chumping in together. We got some cool stuff going down here with the decimal. Okay, that's a neat sounding one. I used this um, patch again when I did Race for Survival, the background music for that. I definitely recognize it. Sounded like we had the string part as well, too. Yeah, that's our string part there. Interestingly enough, there's actually a muted string part right here, this majestic strings. I'd recorded something, but obviously didn't want it used in the end. Um, so I'm kind of curious what it sounds like. I guess we'll have a listen to it. It's very dramatic. I 
go and figure out this chord progression again. If, if you uh, can figure it out and leave it in the comments, that, that works too. Uh, but it's, it's yours if you want it, whatever chords I used here. I, I think they're really cool. So it's with a minor chord at least. Probably A minor. towards the end I just kind of ran out of ideas Maybe that's why I kept it out I wonder what it sounds like with that string part in and I'll just kind of play it from the drop here <laughs> I can see why I left it out. It is a little bit distracting, but it is kind of interesting to hear it back in that context there. Now there is this part going on, and I was actually really happy with this melody. It was so tough to do this. Like I, I took, you can see here, 36 takes to get this <laughs> to get this part right. <laughs> it's because it's in this 5-8 time signature that I just wasn't wasn't really enjoying playing. But you have these two parts going together, Lone Prophet here and a couple of harpsichords happening. And you're, you're going to see the harpsichord pop up a lot in my music. I love the sound of the harpsichord. Yeah, so we had some interesting things going on there. I really like how the 5-8 uh, time signature makes this sound a bit like a shuffle. Kind of an odd shuffle. There's there's a weird quality to it that I think is kind of interesting. Had I been able to play it maybe a little bit tighter, uh, it might have locked into the drum part a little bit better. But eventually, after 36 takes, you're like, ah, you know what, it's good enough. <laughs> Um, interestingly, there are a couple of things going on over here, I noticed. These these uh, tracks here have been muted manually, so if I go to my unmute tool, let's hear what they originally sounded like, and I'm just going to solo the two of them instead, so that we can hear them. <laughs> well, <laughs> that idea obviously didn't make it into the final cut. <laughs> <laughs> the final cuts, yeah, yeah. All right, so I understand why they were cut. They definitely don't match the feel of the rest of the song. They are in 5.8, so there was probably just an idea I was trying out at the time, but uh, yeah. So you can see this one was a little bit more of a work in progress, and what we got in the end I think worked pretty well. All right, so here we are at Search and Rescue, and this is really where I turned the corner as a... Uh, producer of this kind of music this genre of music this i think like at least in my opinion looking back at this song this is a notable step up in in quality and craftsmanship compared to the previous ones we've looked at here um so just at the start here we get this really interesting drum intro i think and i like how minimalist it is overall i'll just play the, the intro so you can hear it here Even though you have that huge lead in, <laughs> it's, I don't know how many measures that is. Uh, wow. Yeah, a full eight measures of drum lead in. You don't have a big crash at the start of the song. It's just, it's just a bass part gets added in, a little synth bass. And we actually lose some parts. We lose this atmospheric sounding one that uh, kind of starts us off, this, this sound. Yeah, we actually kind of lose this one. And you can see there's a ton of automation going on here. There's a tremolo being added to it. It's being panned around. So lots of stuff going on there. <laughs> and then it's cut off right at, the, right at the start there. Yeah, so I had a mute on it so that we can hear the bass come in on its own. Nice little synth bass there, of course. Now, how did I do the drum thing, that, that drum lead-in? Well, it's all through automation as well, too, and 
Whew. That is a lot of automation. <laughs> uh, wow. I don't even remember doing all that. That's crazy. Look at all the frequencies being adjusted. So many points of automation here. I'll move that a little bit out of the way. Yeah, so I, I, I guess there was a lot of work that went into making the drums sound that way at the start. Uh, I'm glad they turned out well, though. <laughs> okay, so let's let's break this one down. As you can see from the drum part here, and this one's using the hip hop kit number two. Yeah, um, the drum part doesn't change up. So is Slugger breaking the A section B section rule? Maybe. Looks like the parts down here kind of split it up a little bit, though. So we'll see what happens. What's going on with this bass part? Oh yeah, this is the B section. I remember how this song goes now. Yeah, this is this part. And I think there there is one effect or one um, uh, track, I should say, that makes that section what it is, and it's it's going to be this this part right here. So if I take it out, it's completely different. Oh, it's not that one. Whoops, my bad. It's, uh, oh, it's these ones down here. It's this one. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So this, these parts are pretty important. All right, so what's going on here? Well, it's a synth, uh, synthetic orchestra, and I've modified it somewhat. So um, unfortunately, that information isn't saved here, but at least this does start uh, start me down the right path. So if I want to recreate this sound, I need to go back to it uh, in my synthesizer and actually edit the patch uh, in the synthesizer, which is how I was able to create it here. Uh, this song, notably, features quite a bit of guitar in it as well, too. So in uh, in this one here, I've got three different guitar parts all lined up here. Rev for uh, Rev Star, which is the the guitar I used at the time, and that's the neck pickup. And then we have the uh, mid being cut uh, because it has a uh, coil tap feature to it, and then the bridge pickup uh, with with the coil tap as well too. Uh, and if I take those, just listen to them on their own, we get our little guitar ensemble here, which starts. Here. Yeah, that, that little that little uh, shift in pitch there. That's that's me pulling up on the uh, the whammy bar or the tremolo arm there to actually create that sound. So I'm pulling up rather than pushing down. Da, kind of create that sound. Yeah. <laughs> I remember having to slap a capo on to get this in the right key too, so it's actually fighting against the capo as well too, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, I think that that's actually some of the best guitar harmony I've ever written there. It's between those parts right there. So I think if I listen to one on their own, yeah, how about this one? Doing the same part. And this is the harmony part. Yeah. In the in the second phrase here, I'm not as happy with the guitar harmony. I think I could have probably found better notes, but oh well. It breaks a few rules. Uh, here it is, soloed. So the, more harmonics here as well too. So that this is, uh, I think, fret seven harmonics or fret uh, fret five harmonics, and then we have fret twelve harmonics right here. Of course, this is all done with the capo though. So this is probably somewhere else on the guitar, and I don't remember what the capo setting was. Unfortunately, should have wrote that down actually in this information here. No physical bass guitar in this song, as far as I can tell. Yeah, no, the, the two bass parts are both synth, synth bass. So the real instrument is the guitar in this song. So I was able to get that in there. I'm curious what some of these other parts are here, what this one is. 
<laughs> that's that's brilliant. All right, so I remember recording this little thing here. It's uh, it's like a little electric piano. It's in the chorus. Very soft, and it's against all this. <laughs> Which is why uh, earlier I was talking about how this song was like Slugger turning the corner on this sort of stuff. This is more typical of my modern day production where there are little parts like these, little, little things that kind of sit in here. And so that's why you're getting like something that has 14 or so active channels all doing things at the same time. And that doesn't necessarily mean the music's better. It just means there's more layers to it. And sometimes that's a bad thing. Um, with those earlier songs, I'm not sure if adding this sort of junk in there would have made those songs better. Uh, who's to say? Let's see what this is here. Yeah. This, this bass that I was able to make out of this, uh, this, this is actually the same uh, synth orchestra patch that I used in the chorus, that, that, that really bright sounding one, this one up here. Somehow I was able to shift it around and make it into a bass part as well too. And I think they both sound fantastic. Really great patch sounds, here they are together. solo bit. I forgot about this. Alright, let's listen to that solo bit on its own. So here's this little synth solo that comes in. It's all counter melody, counter melody stuff. And I think this is, a, is another vital part of what makes music interesting to listen to, uh, especially within this sort of genre, is to have little counter melodies. Uh, now, in order to do that, you kind of need a good knowledge base of your chords. I can't remember the chords of this song at all, so I'm uh, less, less than helpful there. Uh, but you do want to know what your diatonic notes are. And diatonic notes, basically, that boils down to what are the notes that sound good with the chords that are being played underneath. And that is stuff that you can just look up. Like, Google will tell you that those answers. So if, if this is an A-flat chord that's being played down here, all I need to Google is A-flat diatonic notes, and boom, it'll give them to you right there. It, usually it's just going to be either the major or minor scale, depending on the chord type there. Uh, sometimes the pentatonic scale is a safe way to go as well, too. Um, so in this context, we have this little part, uh, that little melody line there. And it's because we took the bass out here. The bass has been muted. So this part doesn't have the punch that the other uh, chorus had until we get the bass coming in here with, with the, uh, the chorus. So here we are taking a look at the song Orsome. <laughs> Just kind of a funny title, but it is a lot more rock focused than our previous ones have been. Right off the hop here you can see there's tons of stuff going on here, but it just keeps going. There's 20 active channels here, so this is quite the monster of a song. Uh, it's a lot longer than our previous ones as well, too. I think that this one clocks in closer to four, four and a half minutes. Uh, now in this one, I'm already breaking a few rules here right off the hop. I've got my drum track here, but I didn't label it, right? It's just called drums. I don't know what drum patch I used here. Uh, in addition to that, I'm playing the bass guitar in this section coming up here. And I didn't write down what bass guitar it was either, so who knows? I did do a few things right in terms of my labeling. I've got Europe Express here, <laughs> obviously a Kraftwerk reference with that patch name there, and it's in the other synth bank. So if I want to find it later, I can find it there. It's this one, which I'm using for the bass line, essentially. Whereas the bass guitar is kind of just punching in. They come together on this, these two chords here. So a lot of the low end is actually being covered by this synthesizer, and the bass guitar is done for something more melodic, which is a um, composition motif that I like to use quite frequently. 
There is a little bit of a rotary organ that comes in as well too, on those cords. Very soft, not overpowering. What else do we got down here? Well, it looks like that's basically what's happening for our A section. There's a bit of a breath echo thing going on down here. I'll try to move this out of the way. I don't know if that's got it. We got try this coming through, which is a funny patch sound on that synthesizer. Yeah, and it's, it's very quiet in the mix. And a bit of scatter, which is another one of my favorites for synth sounds. This is all just happening underneath this, adding a little bit of nuance to the atmosphere. So let's see what's going on here, because this, this is the big, big ticket item that's happening here. This is the B section, essentially. All right, let's break this down. Let's break this down. So lots of things happening. We got a new drum part. Drum part's slightly different. More kick focused. Actually, you know what? Yeah, this is finger drums. Yeah, I played this. I played this with, with uh, on the synthesizers. This is me using the finger drums because you can actually see all the edits in there as well too where I had to chop it up and snap it to the grid. Uh, so I, I must have had a very specific drum pattern in mind that the synthesizer just didn't have a preset for. So that's interesting. Um, looks like we've got some other sounds here. What's this one here? Nice. Yeah, you can pair that with the 12-string guitar, making a reappearance from the, um, what was that song called? Driller Night, from Driller Night. Yeah. Here's the Europe Express thing, also doing the same melody. Repeat it there. <laughs> Pizzicato strings as well, too. Nice. And we have a sitar as well, too. So a lot of interesting elements combine. Give it an otherworldly nature. Some of the secrets of Planet U, that sort of idea. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. Now, in terms of what's going on with the chord structure here, this this is an interesting bit of um, bit of work here because the the chords um, don't line up with your standard 4-4, four, four, or it isn't just, just four chords. Uh, there's, there's I think, a fifth chord that it adds in there. I can't remember. So that's your first chord, second chord, third chord, fourth chord. Oh, I remember now. Fifth chord, sixth chord, and then it repeats. So that was kind of one of the cool things about this piece of music, uh, this composition, was that it was a six chord pattern, not not four, eight, and most music is gonna kind of fall within those those two chunks there. Either it's gonna be four chords in a repeating loop, or it's gonna be eight chords, or I guess I should say measures, uh, four measures or eight measures, whereas this is six measures and then it repeats. So I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, challenge to do there. Um, there are some other parts that are going on with this as well too. We've got a synth part down here. Yeah, and these parts are just basically playing those chords. Oh, nice inversion. Yeah. back to the root chord yeah my and again we're in a minor key here i think this might be f sharp minor if i recall correctly i could be wrong though it's been a while since i played this yeah and we have this low bass part <laughs> very spacey and again of course that's a synthesizer uh that's playing that bass part so it's not a physical bass again I'd like to use the bass guitar, the physical instrument, for more melodic purposes than um, for uh, bass purposes, in these songs at least. And here's a great example of that. The bass actually comes in again in the second half of this, and I'll, I'll uh, play it along with the chords underneath so we get a chance to hear it. And it plays a counter melody. And I really like that that little counter melody there. And I think that's one of the secrets, again, and I know I talked about it in the last song that we were looking at here, but you want to have 
good counter melodies whenever you can. Now, not too much to make it too busy. There's no shame in chopping things out. You don't have to go with everything that you recorded. Uh, you, you can you can mute some things like like we did in a uh, water lot of fun there were, there was that extra string part that I wrote and listening back to it on its own it sounded cool but when you put it in with the mix it sounded too busy so I think it was a good choice to chop that part out uh, this this song doesn't look like it had much chopped out but it does look like it had a lot of copy and paste which is uh, another staple make, make your life easy just you know use copy and paste and oftentimes you can actually get away with copy and pasting if you have a physical instrument that you then play over top and it maybe it's doing something different or something a little bit more dynamic some, something like that and that can help glue the parts together and make it sound more natural more holistic it looks like we have a rotary organ going through this i wonder what this is doing here Cool, cool. I wish I could hear that more. Let's bring it up. Oh, it's like really down in the mix there. Oh yeah, okay, minus 11 there. So let's bring it here. Let's bring it up here. That's great. <laughs> I almost wish I could hear that more in the in the final mix of the song. So that's a part kind of lost to time there. <laughs> I must have chopped it down there just to uh, keep it a little bit more balanced. Oh well. Um, we do have some reversed guitar going on in this song as well too. And there is actually a, a guitar being played a few times. You can hear it here, for example. So that's uh, me playing the guitar, right? And holding uh, some strings and I slowly bend them apart and then I reverse the sound uh, actually by going into the audio processing and reverse the track so that we can get it played back uh, in the opposite direction that's what gives it that cool kind of sound to it now of course the guitar comes in later with a whole guitar riff I wouldn't bother with a guitar riff like that, but it, you know, it felt appropriate, and uh, I don't know. It's probably my least favorite part of the song. It's kind of like a C section of the song, so we had an A, a B, and then the C section, kind of the bridge, and uh, yeah, not super in love with it, but it made sense at the time. So then we get this part, and this part's interesting. This is the final chorus, or the final B section of the song, and in this part, the bass guitar and the synth bass play the bass line because in the previous choruses, the bass guitar didn't. And so we actually do have it kind of strumming along with its thing like that. And where does the counter melody go? Well, it goes to the strings. So your, your counter melodies don't have to be elaborate, but if it's something that you could hum over top of the part, like if you're listening back to it, you know, with, with all, all the other parts and you don't hear this. Something like that, right? Where you can kind of sing or hum a little melody over top and then figure it out on, on your synthesizer or piano or whatever instruments you're using uh, and put it in. I think, I think that's a strong option because uh, it adds more life. Something interesting to the not just copy and paste. Then we finally get this guitar part at the end. And this is all reversed as well. Rebel Trouble. This is the next song we're taking a look at here. And it was actually originally based off of one of the musical motifs that appears in the PC game soundtrack. Uh, it's kind of tough to hear 
especially because it's been extrapolated upon so so dramatically here with uh, especially like this sort of stuff. But th that that melody da 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 that little melody motif there is something that appears in one of the PC game soundtrack uh, songs or something like it. Uh, so I tried to borrow that and adapt it over here for this song. Uh, th this one, I think, is one of my favorites in terms of the way it turned out. I really enjoy the start of it. It's got a real nice trancey kind of sound to it. Uh, where we go. Yeah. And it looks like Slugger did a pretty good job of labeling this stuff, because not only do I have the patch listed here, but I have the bank listed right afterwards, so I can find them later, which is nice. Now we get everything kind of moving together. And that's that bass guitar, that's a physical bass guitar that I'm playing there as well too. And it's, again, uh, delegated to the uh, counter melody task. So it's doing this da da da. That's the first three notes of the melody, our, our main motif. Da 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 da. And it's actually playing that I think with a a little uh, pad thing here. I wonder if it's this one. That's it. Yeah. So this is kind of like we're um, foreshadowing the melody that's going to happen later on in the song. Again, you can see, if I just zoom out, you can see the difference in the sections, A section, B section, right? That's that sort of idea. You can see it color-coded there, which is nice to be able to do that. Uh, the drum part actually has a second bit of drums, a uh, little bit of percussion work that comes in halfway through uh, in the, the final chorus here. So this is my drum part, which is, I don't know. <laughs> it's something, it's something. But I wanted to have this kind of Alan Parsons-inspired uh, drum fill that kind of rotates and comes through, so it's this part that comes in. Dunga dunga, right? Yeah, and there, there's a, a song by the Alan Parsons Project, uh, I think called Lucifer, that does something like that in, in it. Um, yeah, by the way, if, if you're into this, this kind of music, um, Alan Parsons Project, Hyper Gamma Spaces is the song you should probably listen to. It's very influential in this, in this uh, style, this genre. All right, let's see what else we got going on here. So you had the bass guitar and it's doing its own thing over here. Looks like it's just playing the chords. Yeah, sounds good, good tone. Uh, looks like we got some synth bass that's doing that too, probably. Oh yeah, just adding some low end there. Yeah, nothing too crazy. Then we have our main melodies that are going on down here. So you got you got the the main motif. Da 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 that's this. Oh I guess without that. Yeah, there it is. So pretty dancey, pretty dancey. Um with this part here you have a synth pad kind of bass thing doing its thing down here. And then throughout the entire chorus, we have, there's that 12 string guitar patch coming back again. This is its third time making an appearance and a funk guitar, interesting. Yeah, I remember having to, that, that uh, last measure of music there, having to figure out the notes for that. I remember that one being kind of difficult. So this is a musical technique known as an ostinato. Um, basically what that is, is it boils down to a rhythmic figure that doesn't have a lot of melodic information in it. So we're not listening to this and humming along a little melody. It's meant to be texture that you kind of season on top. So if I go the opposite direction here and uh, we listen to the whole thing without it, it sounds quite hollow, it's missing something. So you add a little bit of this in. Oops, sorry, I'm doing this the wrong order. There we go. It fills in the gaps. And then here it's intentionally left out to allow for this lead up. And this is a straight like copy and paste. You just grab here and you just paste it over here. Right? So that's that's the sort of stuff that we're looking at sometimes. Is we're just gonna copy and paste and move some things over. Yeah. So anyways, this this um, 
this is a technique that once you can develop how to how to write this sort of um, ostinato pattern sometimes it can be really simple and actually the last song that we're looking at here today my most recent one has an incredibly simple ostinato that i think is really really important this one's quite complex though there's there's a lot of notes uh, honestly it might bend the definition of ostinato a little bit i'm using it for the purpose of an ostinato but there's there's just so much going on in it in terms of all the eighth notes, da 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 dum da 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 dum da 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 dum. Right, all this descending line, de do de do de 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 de. Right, and you have that little melody kind of traced in there. So it could be considered a counter melody. It might fall into that category. It's not too much more I want to talk about here. I know there's like there's a lot of cool synth sounds going on in this. Oh, there's the bass. <laughs> yeah, I think that fits Rock Raiders pretty well, actually. Yeah, this little thing, I don't know what this thing's doing. Bottom? Yeah, okay, it's adding that, that little thing. There it is, yeah. This uh, synth right here, this one called Newcomers from the Pulsating Bank, is doing so much heavy, heavy lifting in this song, I think. Yeah. There's that bass line counter melody there as well, too. Really groovy tune. I really enjoy this one. Is that this thing that's doing that? No, it isn't. Oh, it's a different thing. Ah, oh, it's this thing. Okay, I was wondering, what what is this? Uh... Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that really helps shape this section of the song. Really good, really good. Um, <laughs> I know I started this video by saying uh, these, these are not high works of art, uh, but I really do value this one. <laughs> I don't know what it is about this one that makes me interested. Oh, interesting, a bass part or a drum part that is muted. Let's hear what that sounds like. Ooh. Well that, ooh, well that would have taken the song in a very different direction there. I'm just curious, I'm just gonna slap it on here. It's probably gonna sound terrible, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah, that's kinda cool. Let's talk about the uh, harmonic rhythm here. Harmonic rhythm is when chords happen. When do the chord changes happen? Oftentimes in this style of music, this genre of music, it's just every four uh, four beats. So like every measure, it's a new chord. And I'm pretty guilty of writing uh, this, this music in that style. But this song actually plays with that idea a little bit. So instead of it happening every four beats, we actually get some chord changes that happen in between as well too. So let me go ahead and grab uh, which one do I want to listen to here? We'll do this bass part and the bass guitar, I think. All right, so here we are, chord number one. Chord number two, and then chord number three, then chord number four. And then the pattern repeats. So if we, if we count out our beats with that as well too, we have one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, switch chord, two, three, four, switch chord, two, three, four, final chord, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So all told, you have six measures of music, just like the last song that we looked at here with Orsum. Six measures of music, this one's just kind of split up a little bit differently. The first and last chord are held for two measures, and then there's two chords that happen in the middle that pivot really quickly. And I was actually really happy with how that turned out. It, it's Again, it's atypical, 
because you have uh, you have a rotation that's happening every six measures, and it means that your melodies and ostinatos have to reflect that, uh, which can be difficult sometimes. Uh, and we'll get to difficult ostinatos and melodies in the uh, last song that we look at here today, because uh, there's one in there that was really, really challenging for me. Here we are taking a look at the song It's a Hold Up. And I think of all the, the songs we're looking at here today, I think that my mix on this one I'm the least happy with in, in the end. Uh, I wouldn't mind going back and maybe taking another pass at things. It's very dark, very, very muddy sounding to my ears. Uh, if this is your jam though, by all means, it definitely sets a mood. The drums are just drowning in reverb, which is probably the, the problem. <laughs> Get a little bit of a fake bass here. Yeah, and normally like this on its own sounds pretty bad, but when you cover it up with so much other stuff, you can sometimes get away with it. Because I think the ear is listening to some of these other things. This uh, Time Splitters patch that I made here, it just reminds me of some of the music in Time Splitters. Yeah, mix that with some of these other parts. Interesting, yeah. Is it possible for a piece of music to be warm and icy at the same time? Because <laughs> that's what I kind of feel when I listen to this. <laughs> it sounds cold because of the high, high-pitched little things. That's I think we're just kind of programmed to hear this sort of sound as being icy. <laughs> Through so much media, they use this video games and ice levels and things like that. But then of course you have like these really warm string pads going on underneath that. Get a little bit of the two together there. This is another song that uses uh, a lot of empty space effectively, I think, which is this part with the, uh, the kit, the bass guitar that comes in, and then eventually we get some synthesizer parts that join it as well too. Let me move this out of the way. Here it is. So just that bass part on its own. This is me playing the bass again. And the reason why it sounds so choppy like that is because I'm actually using a foam mute up against the strings to mute them from resonating. So it's kind of a unique sound, and I kind of liked it in that part there. Uh, of course, then we have the melody repeated again on two different two different uh, synth patches here. One of them, this Amadeus one, is a harpsichord. Again, I love the harpsichord, so I try to throw it in for this sort of pattern. And then this is an analog um, or a re representation, it's still a digital synth, but. Yeah, and it's just repeating the pattern there, that little, little figure with this little... Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I really like this part that comes in. This is definitely counter melody stuff here. Okay, this little melody comes in. More synth mallet stuff. Oh yeah, this is this is probably a proper little solo that happens here. There's actually two solos happening at the same time between the two. So you got the low one here. And you have this one here as well too. So if you're doing like a little descending little motif like this, you gotta know what your diatonic notes are. All right, so there's a, there's a big flurry of notes. I mean, it's not very fast or very virtuosic or anything like that, um, but you gotta know what the right notes are ahead of time. So. 
this sort of material here is probably improv this is probably stuff that just kind of came up with on the fly seeing as there's not a lot of cuts or anything in here so I didn't feel the need to go in with a fine tooth comb and redo any of it which is nice and here's the bass guitar again it's got tons of effects on it oh a flanger on it nice and chorus now this one doesn't have the mute on it slide at the end there as well too yeah kind of a strange song to be honest yeah kind of a strange one uh, the, the choruses quote unquote the choruses i guess the b sections here where the drum kits actually change i guess i could have color coded them differently here so it would reflect that the b sections or choruses are very minimalist where it's just drums and bass and then like some harpsichords come in uh, and then there's actually a bridge, which is this section here. This would be the C part with, with all the solos and everything kind of going on over top of it. You got this little drum part here I didn't talk about. Thump, thump. Thump, 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 thump. Right. <laughs> That's all finger drums. Just some extra percussion in there. Yeah, this is doing a lot of heavy lifting too. Some nice chords there at the end too. I remember this one being in the key of G minor. Now it, it's all ba based on that um, menu music. The main menu music in Rock Raiders is in the key of G minor and uh, a lot of the songs that I wrote then were based on that so I decided to keep them all in the key of G minor. That sort of benchmark. All right here we go. This is the last song, A Breath of Fresh Air. It's my most recent song and this is I guess my last opportunity to impart any passing wisdom I can on the uh, the composition process as we go here. Uh, again, you're seeing lots of patterns again, right? So here's my drum part, that's the A section. There is a bit of a pre-chorus in this song, which I highlighted, and then we get to the chorus, right? So that's the B section. So you're going A to B, and then sometimes you need a little bit of glue to get there. Uh, with this one here, this song uniquely is the first time out of any of my music I've actually used some of the Rock Raiders sound effects in it. Uh, which are these audio parts here. So there's a little bit of some of the drips and things like that from the game. Um, there's also the, uh, uh, oh no, sorry, this is this is uh, something else here. But yeah, so you get a little bit of the ice ambient. Now it's turned down, but you get some of the drips as well too. And that's all going on underneath the main mix. This thing that's playing at the start here, basically the only instrument other than the, the drum loop. It's this bell pad, it's a synth pad, but I'm actually feeding it through an, um, I'm feeding it through a amplifier. Let me open up my sidebar, there we go. Yeah, so it's, it's through an amp simulator and it's got a little bit of a tremolo effect on it as well too, which is adding some of the cool factor to it I think. There is a bass guitar that comes in like right away but it's just playing harmonics at the start. This bass guitar is also a fretless bass guitar meaning that it uh, doesn't snap to notes the same way other bass guitars do. And we get to hear a little bit of that in some of the patterns that I play in the chorus with it. Nothing too elaborate here, but there is a little bit of a slide. And actually, I think it's at the end of the first chorus here. There's a good example of it. Let's hear it. There it is, yeah. So you hear this like sliding sound. And so what, what, uh, what this technique is, is when you play on one string, so on this one I'm playing on the A string, and I slide up and then I hit an open E string right after the slide. Right here. Yeah. I think it adds some life and some energy to it. So when we get into that part in the chorus. kind of hear it in the background there with headphones. 
So this this composition, because it's the most recent, I can actually talk a little bit more about it uh, in depth here. It's got a couple of weird chords. And at first, when you start the song, you hear this G. So that's G right there. And it goes F right here and then D. And that's gonna step down to a C natural and then right back up again. So that's a little pattern that's happening there. But once these other pads come in here, it recontextualizes the way we hear that G. So now we got this chord, and I'm just gonna grab this just so you can hear it all together. That G doesn't sound like it's the root note anymore. It, it kind of is still, like this is, this is basically turning it into a, an, uh, I think an 11 chord, G minor 11, is, is that a thing? I don't know. Uh, but the, the notes that I'm playing up here are the fifth, the ninth, and the 11th of the G minor scale. I'm playing them all at the same time. So this weird suspended sound to that. Some diatonic notes here. And then this is another 11 chord right here. So when I go to D here, instead of playing D minor in this hand and uh, up here with the, with the right hand parts, I'm actually playing an A minor chord, which is the fifth, the ninth, and the 11th again. So it creates that weird suspension to it. So we never really feel at home with either one of these chords. And that's all done intentionally to create some suspense and to better lead us into our chorus. So when we get here, we hear the C chord, and this is C right off the hop here. Um, and it, it might be C major mixolydian, it might be C minor, I, I can't quite recall off, off top of my head here, but we start on C, then we go to B flat, down to E flat, up to F. And that's our little chord progression here. And we're hearing C as the root note. Uh, I think, as, as the one chord, I should say, the tonic. Now, there's a ton of stuff going on in this course, and I really want to dive into it here a little bit more, so let, let's break it down. So, right off the top here, we have uh, what I would consider to be one of my more complicated melodic passages here, and it's done with the Judy lead and the square sequence patches, this little thing. So why, why is that any more difficult than the other stuff we've been hearing so far? Well, it's because it doesn't start on beat one. We have beat one as a rest, and then it comes in one. All right, so you can hear it there. Right, it's coming right afterwards here. I'll give it a little bit more lead in. One, four, one, and two, and three. In, indeed, with the counting, and you can hear it in, in my counting here, we've actually um, done a meter change. We're in 3-4 time now. When, when the start of the song, like, we're feeling this very much in 4. 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. Meter change. 1 and 2 and 3 and 1 and 2 and 3 and 1. And th this is uh, really uncharted territory for me. I, I don't think I've ever written a song that goes to 3-4 in the chorus. Um, it, it's a really tough meter to use effectively, I find, uh, without it just sounding like a waltz. But in this case, I think the drum loop kind of pulled me out of the fire in this case. I think the drum loop's what inspired this. So in the drums, we have this really interesting shift. So it starts in half time, and then it goes full time there. Full time, half time, full time, half time, full time. And because it does that, it actually cuts out uh, a full beat from, from the measure. We're feeling this song very slow. It's 73 beats per minute. And uh, yeah, just by dropping a full beat, now we're in 3-4. And yet the song doesn't lose its bop. Like I still find my head bopping to this song when we get into the 3-4 section because you're grooving with the quarter note. It doesn't matter what the meter is in this case here. As long as the quarter note is consistent, it could be 5-4, five, uh, five, it could be 6-4. As long as that quarter note is consistent throughout, you're gonna bop along. All right, so that's the melody. Da -do -da -do -da 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 -da, like that little thing right there, right? We've got this thing going underneath. These are the chords. Nothing crazy there. 
Upon the second repetition here, now we throw in the ostinato. And this ostinato is a lot, uh, or is much more simple compared to the previous one I talked about, I think in Orsum. Uh, but this ostinato pattern is just a sequence of uh, four notes repeated back on themselves. So I think, I think there's six in total. Da 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 something like that. Sounds like this. So when you listen to that on its own, you might be thinking of it in 6-8 uh, time. right? Um, something like that. Now, that actually plays really well against the 3-4 the meter, because in 3-4 uh, time, the eighth notes are the same as in 6-8, so you can actually stack them up against each other really well, and you get this nice um, polyrhythm. And it should sound a little something like this, then. Yeah, yeah, which I think is interesting. So, so you have um, different stresses in the ostinato versus the melody and the drum part. They're kind of doing their, their own thing there. Um, so I thought that was kind of neat. Uncharted territory for me as well, too, to do an ostinato that was uh, rhythmically different or rhythmically more challenging uh, against the uh, melody. Uh, then the melody transfers over to, you guessed it, harpsichords. <laughs> We've got two different harpsichords here playing the melody. And we actually add in another ostinato doing the same thing an octave higher. So that's this part down here. Very soft. I found it to be a little too overpowering with the two of them, so I made the higher, higher voice a little bit softer. That can actually kind of get confusing without the drums in there too. Tons of cool stuff going on in that part there. Um, you might have noticed these uh, slivers here. Let me see if I can move that out of the way. This is a <laughs> a part that I manually chopped up these these two tracks down here. I chopped it up to create the um, kind of phasing sound. This, these little voices. Uh, 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 uh. And I used automation to pan them outwards as it, as time went along. So I threw in this automation line on both of them to pan them to either side so, so they start kind of centered and then slowly it's going to sound more ping pong so i thought that was a neat little touch there as well too and i just need something there to get us between the um verse or the a section material because it's very different so i need something and i think they're, this is just a low g which actually serves as a nice pivot into C if you know uh, any music harmony because G is the fifth of C. So this is a 5-1 chord progression here, uh, otherwise known as an authentic cadence. And in authentic cadences, we, we want uh, to... It, it's, a, it's a tool that we can use as composers to lead the listener to wherever we want them to go. So at the start of the song, at the very start of this song, I think the listener hears this G as the one chord. This is the tonal center of the song. We're hearing this as home. And as the as we add more instruments, we challenge that idea. So these instruments are telling the listener, maybe this isn't what you thought it was, because they're not reaffirming that note. And even the bass guitar is kind of doing its own thing with these harmonics. I think it's constantly playing a G and a D in the harmony there with the harmonics. Can't remember entirely. But anyways, because we have so so much ambiguity behind the key of the song here, when we le when we leave off here and start heading to the chorus, we get this G. But it doesn't necessarily sound like a one chord yet. Instead, it pivots here. A bit of a key change. coming in that helps really fill out the sound. Of course, if you're ever worried about ostinatos being too too overbearing, you can always bring them down in the mix, throw some reverb on them, whatever you need to do in order to, to make it work. Pass the 
melody off here to harpsichords. They almost sound like pipe organs in this in this context here. Kind of cool. So e flat. Then we go to F, and then we go back to G right here. And this actually kind of forms a flat six, flat seven, one progression. And that's that's a really common progression as well too. You can kind of lead the listener where you want them to go with that as well too. So flat six would be E flat in the key of G. Then we have, oh sorry, here I guess I got the around. There's their E flat, so flat six, flat seven with D, and then we go to one with G in the new key here. I think this song was pretty successful at that. It, it, I don't think that, switch like feels too unnatural so i was happy about that uh at the end of the song here we just we're really just grooving with everything going on here we add the synthesizers back in with the harpsichords here way. and we actually have some strings come in just to fill it out a little bit this was a really late addition to, to the whole um the whole thing here And then we get that bass side at the end of the song. <laughs> Which sounds like like, uh, like a synth bass thing that you'd hear in like a hip-hop song, but it's actually a uh, fretless bass guitar. Fretless uh, Fender Jazz, I think. So, yeah, yeah. I'd like to leave you with a few parting words of wisdom, if I can, uh, from one old slug to another. Uh, one, one thing that you want to do is you want to build a setup that works for you. You don't have to do what works for me. The colors I choose here, don't, don't, you don't have to copy any of this sort of stuff. You don't have to do the drums the way I do. Believe me, if I had a better uh, electric kit and I could play these parts better, then I would, I would definitely do it uh, with, with real drums or, or an, an acoustic kit even. That'd be awesome. This is just a means to an end here. So if you have those resources, please, please feel free to use them. One thing I do recommend that you do is that you have a separate device for your audio engineering. I know that might be a tall order. For myself, I, I've had this separate laptop here uh, for years and years and years. And basically, you basically just want to have a computer or some sort of device that you can detach from the internet. Uh, because you don't want those updates messing with things. <laughs> uh, the, the, the death of almost all uh, digital audio workstations is going to be Windows Update. <laughs> so it, like, they'll, they'll just patch one little thing and it won't change anything else detectable, but then all of a sudden your buses don't work anymore or, or something, right? Like, like the, you just come back to it one day and all of a sudden something doesn't work and troubleshooting this sort of software is, I don't know, it's, it's the worst nightmare that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy uh, because there's, there's so many different digital audio workstations out there and they all behave differently and your problem is going to be so specific. It's, it'll be a, one specific little minute thing that's going on inside this software that maybe somebody has had this problem before, maybe they haven't. If they have had it before, chances are they're not on the same computer as you. And so all of those settings are going to be different. All those specifications uh, are, are all going to be different. That's going to change your answer as well too. So troubleshooting this sort of software is the worst and you want to avoid it at all costs. So what I recommend doing is getting a setup, make sure it works, you know, go, go through the process, do, do, do all your homework on that sort of stuff, uh, get it to a working order and then disconnect it from the internet and just, just leave it offline. You'll find that your computer runs faster as well too when it's not trying to constantly check in or do all these weird things with the internet. You'll get less audio, um, audio clicks and sounds in, in your recordings as well too. If you do find any of those little digital clicks or distortions that happen when you, when you hit record, it's because the computer is just not able to hold up or, or to keep up with the stream of information that's coming in so there's these little gaps it creates and it creates little pops i can't really demo it anymore because now that i've switched to this computer i don't have that problem anymore <laughs> but when i used to run cubase on my my regular working laptop i'd get those little audio clicks and pops and they're annoying and they're, they're largely unfixable um, from a post-production standpoint so you got to get rid of them as they're getting recorded that's one of the big things there in terms of what software to look for, uh, like, like I've been saying, I've been talking about Cubase. I think it's a good user-friendly software. It, it, it is going to cost you a little bit of money, I think, to, to get it. Um, I've, I, of course, have this old license that I've been using for years and years now. 
And you'll also need some sort of way to interface with uh, quarter inch jacks or XLR cables if you're using any instruments or microphones of that variety, uh, which I encourage you to do if, if, if you do know some instruments, you want to lean on that skill. I, th I think Slugger's music is is good because Slugger is able to play the bass guitar and, and other instruments as well too. So I think that, that adds something to this, uh, which I think is important to keep in mind. Um, in, in terms of post-production mastering, I don't do anything too crazy on the mastering stage. There is going to be a little plug-in. Well, let me see if I have it here. A spatial, yeah, stereo enhancer. Yeah, you're probably going to get some sort of plug-in that looks something like this. It's a stereo enhancer, and you, you want to use it during the mastering stage, which is going to be in a different program. I use WaveLab, but there's many others. And what I encourage you to not do is don't take this dial and crank it up to maximum. Yes, this will make your song sound bigger, but what it does is it really messes with your mix. It makes the things that are panned further left and right louder and you don't necessarily want that usually when i mix something out i've got this about between 130 or 140 depending on depending on the song so you kind of want to keep it around there i'd say uh, you also want to put some sort of limiter on as well too which uh, where do i have limiters there we are oops that's a maximizer ha grab the wrong one limiter probably want to put some some sort of limiter on as well too uh, maybe a production limiter here we are production limiter perfect so this is just going to cap it off so that no at no point in your song is it going to go above zero decibels because then you start getting clipping and you start getting peaking and you want to avoid all of that of course because that's going to sound bad it's going to make everything sound bad uh, don't be afraid of doing multiple mixes multiple passes the one song we were looking at earlier it's a hold up it, it was a rare occasion where I actually went back and remixed the whole song um, versus the original mix that I came up with. And I think it, it's the new mix is what you hear in the videos and in um, uh, what, what is available there. The old mix was just too muddy sounding. Like it sounded fine with the headphones, but you want to listen to it through a number of different devices. Your mix is going to sound different if you only mix with headphones. So you're going to want to mix with uh, some stereo speakers at some point in time. You'll probably want to play it in, in your car stereo as well too, to hear it there. Play it through your, your phone, through an iPad, whatever you can, laptop speakers. Because uh, when you consider what device most people are going to be listening to your music with, uh, you just want to make sure it sounds good on those devices. That's, that's my recommendation there. One more thing I'll mention here is that I feel like compositions... Hmm, should have melodies <laughs> in some regard. Uh, not, of course, not every composition of every genre needs that, but I feel like that's one of the strong aspects of um, Slugger's music here, or my music, I guess I should say, uh, is, is little moments like this where you have something you can latch onto in a part like this. If I didn't have that there, Yes, we still hear this as the chorus, even with the ostinato and everything. We still hear it as the chorus, but there's less for the ear to latch onto. It kind of reduces it to sounding simple, to my ear at least. So having a little bit of something you can latch onto with the ear, I think it's important. So not only melody, but counter melody as well too. Now this song doesn't have uh, any instances of counter melody. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think it does. Yeah, not, not even here. It's got some harmony. Yeah. Got a little bit of harmony here, but uh, yeah, no counter melody. But counter melody is another strong suit as well, too. You don't want to overdo it, though. Try to err on the side of simplicity with, with counter melodies, because they can be really overpowering if you lean into them too far. Uh, one other aspect I would say is that you want to kind of start and set out what are the chords that you're going to be using in this song? Don't just leave it up to random chance. If you know your Roman numeral chords and you can do and you can do all that in your head or, or on a piece of paper, whatever you need to do, that's great. That sets you up for success. That basically tells you what chords sound good together. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with, with that sort of music theory, I don't can't really get into it right now. Um, it's it's quite in depth, but I'd suggest you look into it. Um, 
because that's the sort of stuff that's going on in my head while I'm while I'm recording this sort of music and learning your diatonic notes like what are the notes that sound good in in this chord or in this key you want to know that um, because then you won't play any wrong notes anymore Lastly, I'll mention that if you have any questions about any of the stuff that I talked about in this video, or you want to see me talk about the Time Cruisers songs as well, too, because they're, they're quite a bit different than this, um, I'm happy to take a look at those if people want to see that. And if you have any questions, you can either leave them down in the comment section or feel free to email me as well, too, rrslugger at protonmail.com. And I would love to hear what you come up with as well, too. So if you have any tracks that you're working on and you want feedback or you just want to share them with me, uh, you can send them over to that email address and I'm happy to check them out. I think it'd be neat to see what people are working on there. Thank you so much if you've stuck around this whole time. Hopefully this has been somewhat insightful or somewhat interesting to, to you know bask in some of the music and talk about uh, the different things that work and different things that don't work uh, in these songs. Uh, thank you very much for listening along, and I will see you next time for another video.